Chapter Twenty Seven of the Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Twenty Seven. When I woke, I did not remember for some moments where I was. Feeling about me, my hand came in contact with the grass, wet with the dew. It was very dark, only low down in the sky, a pale gleam of light gave promise, as I imagined, of coming day. Then recollection flashed upon me, and I sprang up, alarmed, to my feet, only to discover, with inexpressible relief, that the light I had remarked was in the west, not the east, and proceeded from the young moon just sinking beneath the horizon. Saddling my two animals expeditiously, I rode to Peralta's estancia, and on arriving there carefully drew the horses into the shadow of a clump of trees growing on the borders of the ancient, well-nigh obliterated fosse or ditch. I then dropped on to the ground, so as to listen better for approaching footsteps, and began waiting for Demetria. It was past midnight, not a sound reached me except at intervals the mournful, far away, reedy note of the little nocturnal cicada that always seemed to be there, lamenting the lost fortunes of the house of Peralta. For upwards of half an hour I remained lying on the ground, growing more anxious every moment, and fearing that Demetria was going to fail me, when I caught a sound, like a human whisper, listening intently, I found that it pronounced my name, and proceeded from a clump of tall thorn apples some yards from me. Who speaks? I replied. The tall, gaunt form of Ramona drew itself up out of the weeds, and cautiously approached me. She was shaking with nervous excitement, and had not ventured to come near without speaking for fear of being mistaken for an enemy and fired at. Mother of heaven, she exclaimed, as well as her chattering teeth would allow her to speak, I have been so agitated all the evening. Oh, senor, what are we to do now? Your plan was such a good one. When I heard it, I knew an angel had flown down and whispered it in your ear, and now my mistress will not stir. All her things are ready, clothes, money, jewels, and for the last hour we have been urging her to come out, but nothing will serve. She will not see you, senor. Is Don Hilario in the house? No, he is out. Could anything have been better? But it is useless. She has lost heart and will not come. She only sits crying in her room, saying that she cannot look on your face again. Go and tell her that I am here with the horses, waiting for her, I said. Signor, she knows you are here. Santos watched for you and hastened in to inform her of your arrival. Now she has sent me out only to say that she cannot meet you, that she thanks you for all you have done, and begs you to go away and leave her. I was not greatly surprised at Demetria's reluctance to meet me at the last moment, but was determined not to leave without first seeing her and trying to change her mind. Securing the horses to a tree, I went with Ramona to the house. 
stealing in on tiptoe, we found Demetria in that room where she had received me the evening before in her quaint finery, lying on the sofa, while old Santos stood by her, the picture of distress. The moment she saw me enter, she covered her face with her hands and turned from me. Yet a glance was sufficient to show that with or without her consent everything had been got ready for her flight. On a chair near her lay a pair of saddle-bags in which her few belongings had been stowed. A mantilla was drawn half over her head, and by her side was a large woolen shawl, evidently intended to protect her against the night air. Santos, I said, go out to the horses under the trees and wait there for us. And you, Ramona, say good-bye now to your mistress, then leave us together, for by and by she will recover courage and go with me. Santos, looking immensely relieved and grateful, though a little surprised at my confident tone, was hurrying out when I pointed to the saddle-bags. He nodded, grinned, and snatching them up, left the room. Poor old Ramona threw herself on to her knees, sobbing and pouring out farewell blessings on her mistress, kissing her hands and hair with sorrowful devotion. When she left us, I sat down by Demetria's side, but she would not take her hands from her face or speak to me, and only wept hysterically when I addressed her. I succeeded at last in getting one of her hands in mine, and then drew her head gently down till it rested on my shoulder. When her sobs began to subside, I said, Tell me, dear Demetria, have you lost faith in me that you fear to trust yourself with me now? No, no, Richard, it is not that, she faltered. But I can never look into your face again. If you have any compassion for me, you will leave me now. What? Leave you, Demetria, my sister, to that man how can you imagine such a thing? Tell me, where is Don Hilario? Is he coming back tonight? I know nothing. He may come back at any moment. Leave me, Richard. Every minute you remain here increases your danger. Then she attempted to draw away from me, but I would not release her. If you fear his returning tonight, then it is time for you to come with me, I answered. No, 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 I cannot. All is changed now. It would kill me with shame to look on your face again. You shall look on it again many times, Demetria. Do you think that after coming here to rescue you out of the coils of that serpent, I am going to leave you because you are a little timid? Listen, Demetria, I shall save you from that devil tonight, even if I have to carry you out in my arms. Afterwards, we can consider all there is to be done about your father and your property. Perhaps, when the poor colonel is taken out of this sad atmosphere, his health, his reason even, may improve. Oh, Richard! Are you deceiving me? she exclaimed, suddenly dropping her hands and gazing full into my face. No, I am not deceiving you, and now you will lose all fear, Demetria, for you have looked into my face again and have not been changed to stone. She turned crimson in a moment, but did not attempt to cover her face again, for just then, a clatter of hoofs was heard approaching the house. Mother of heaven, save us, she exclaimed in terror. 
it is Don Hilario. I quickly blew out the one candle burning dimly in the room. Fear nothing, I said, when all is quiet, after he is gone to his room, we will make our escape. She was trembling with apprehension and nestled close to me, while we both listened intently and heard Don Hilario unsaddle his horse, then going softly, whistling to himself, to his room. Now he has shut himself up, I said, and in a few minutes will be asleep. When you think of that man whose persecutions have made your life a burden, so that you tremble when he approaches you, do you not feel glad that I have come to take you away? Richard, I could go willingly with you tonight, but for one thing. Do you think, after what has passed, that I could ever face your wife? She will know nothing of what has passed, Demetria. It would be dishonorable in me, and a cruel injustice to you to speak to her of it. She will welcome you as a dear sister, and love you as much as I love you. All these doubts and fears troubling you are very unsubstantial, and can be blown away like thistle down. And now that you have confessed so much to me, Demetria, I wish to confess also the one thing that troubles my heart. What is it, Richard? Tell me, she said very gently. Believe me, Demetria, I never had a suspicion that you loved me. Your manner did not show it. Otherwise, I should have told you long ago all about my past. I only knew you regarded me as a friend, and one you could trust. If I have been mistaken all along, Demetria, if you have really felt a passion in your heart, then I shall have to lament bitterly that I have been the cause of a lasting sorrow to you. Will you not open your heart more to me, and tell me frankly how it is with you? She caressed my hand in silence for a little while, and then answered, I think you were right, Richard. Perhaps I am not capable of passion like some women. I felt, I knew that you were my friend. To be near you was like sitting in the shade of a green tree in some hot, desolate place. I thought it would be pleasant to sit there always and forget the bitter years. But, Richard, if you will always be my friend, my brother, I shall be more than content, and my life will seem different. Demetria, how happy you have made me. Come, the serpent is sleeping now. Let us steal away and leave him to his evil dreams. God grant that I may return some day to bruise his head with my heel. Then, wrapping the shawl about her, I led her out, treading softly, and in a few moments we were with Santos, patiently keeping watch beside the horses. I gladly let him assist Demetria to her seat on the side saddle, for that was perhaps the last personal service he would be able to render her. The poor old fellow is crying, I believe. His utterance was so husky. Before leaving, I gave him on a scrap of paper my address in Montevideo, and bade him take it to Don Florentino Blanco with a request to write me a letter in the course of the next two or three days to inform me of Don Hilario's movements. We then trotted softly away over the sward, and in about half an hour struck the road leading from Rocha to Montevideo. This we followed till daylight, scarcely pausing once from our swift gallop, and a hundred times during that dark ride over a country utterly unknown to me, 
i blessed the little witch cleta for never was there a more steady sure-footed beast than the ugly roan that carried my companion and when we drew rein in the pale morning light he seemed fresh as when we started we then left the highway and rode across country in a northwesterly direction for a distance of eight or nine miles for i was anxious to be far away from public roads and from the prying prating people that use them about eleven o'clock that morning we had breakfast at a rancho then rode on again till we came to a forest of scattered thorn trees growing on the slopes of a range of hills it was a wild secluded spot with water and good pasturage for the horses and pleasant shade for ourselves so after unsaddling and turning loose our horses to feed we sat down to rest under a large tree with our backs against its portly trunk from our shady retreat we commanded a splendid view of the country over which we had been riding all the morning extending for many leagues behind us and while i smoked my cigar i talked to my companion calling her attention to the beauty of that wide sunlit prospect do you know demetria i said when the long winter evenings come and i have plenty of leisure i intend writing a history of my wanderings in the banda oriental and i will call my book the purple land for what more suitable name can one find for a country so stained with the blood of her children you will never read it of course for i shall write it in english and only for the pleasure it will give to my own children if i ever have any at some distant date when their little moral and intellectual stomachs are prepared for other food than milk but you will have a very important place in my narrative demetria for during these last days we have been very much to each other and perhaps the very last chapter will recount this wild ride of ours together flying from that evil genius hilario to some blessed refuge far away beyond the hills and woods and the blue line of the horizon for when we reach the capital i believe i think i know in fact i hesitated to tell her that it would probably be necessary for me to leave the country immediately but she did not encourage me to go on and glancing round i discovered that she was fast asleep poor demetria she had been dreadfully nervous all night and almost afraid to stop to rest anywhere but now her fatigue had quite overcome her her position against a tree was uncomfortable and insecure so drawing her head very gently down until it rested on my shoulder and shading her eyes with her mantilla i let her sleep on her face looked strangely worn and pallid in that keen noonday light and gazing on it while she slumbered and remembering all the dark years of grief and anxiety she had endured down to that last pain of which i had been the innocent cause i felt my eyes grow dim with compassion after sleeping for about two hours she woke with a start and was greatly distressed to learn that i had been supporting her all that time but after that refreshing slumber a change seemed to come over her not only her great fatigue but the tormenting apprehensions had very nearly vanished out of the nettle danger she had plucked the flower safety and now she could rejoice in its possession and was filled with new life and spirits the unaccustomed freedom 
and exercise with constant change of scene also had an exhilarating effect on mind and body a new colour came into her pale cheeks the purple stains telling of anxious days and sleepless nights faded away she smiled brightly and was full of animation so that on that long journey whether resting in the noonday shade or swiftly cantering over the green turf i could not have had a more agreeable companion than demetria this change in her often made me remember santos's pathetic words when he told of the ravages of grief and said that another life would make his mistress a flower amongst women it was a comfort that her affection for me had been indeed nothing but affection but what was i to do with her in the end for i knew that my wife was most anxious to return without further delay to her own country and yet it seemed to me that it would be a hard thing to leave poor demetria behind amongst strangers finding her so improved in spirits i at length ventured to speak to her on the subject at first she was depressed but presently recovering courage she begged to be allowed to go with us to buenos aires the prospect of being left alone was unendurable to her for in montevideo she had no personal friends while the political friends of her family were all out of the country or living in very close retirement across the water she would be with friends and safe for a season from her dreaded enemy this proposal seemed a very sensible one and relieved my mind very much although it only served to remove my difficulty for a time in the department of camelones about six leagues from montevideo i found the house of a fellow countryman named barker who had lived for many years in the country and had a wife and children we arrived in the afternoon at his estancia and seeing that demetria was very much knocked up with our long journey i asked mr barker to give us shelter for the night our host was very kind and pleasant with us asking no disagreeable questions and after a few hours acquaintance which made us quite intimate i took him aside and told him demetria's history whereupon like the good-hearted fellow he was he at once offered to shelter her in his house until matters could be arranged in montevideo an offer which was joyfully accepted End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the purple land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rick vena the purple land by w h hudson chapter twenty eight i was soon back in montevideo after that when i bade demetria good-bye she appeared reluctant to part with me retaining my hand in hers for an unusual time for the first time in her life probably she was about to be left in the company of entire strangers and for many days past we had been much to each other so that it was only natural she should cling to me a little at parting once more i pressed her hand and exhorted her to be of good courage reminding her that in a very few days all trouble and danger would be over still however she did not release my hand this tender reluctance to lose me was affecting and also flattering but slightly inopportune for i was anxious to be in the saddle and away 
Presently, she said, glancing down at her rusty abilements, Richard, if I am to remain concealed here till I go to join you on board, then I must meet your wife in these poor garments. Oh, that is what you are thinking about, Demetria, I exclaimed. At once I called in our kind hostess, and when this serious matter was explained to her, she immediately offered to go to Montevideo to procure the necessary outfit, a thing I had thought nothing about, but which had evidently been preying on Demetria's mind. When I at length reached the little suburban retreat of my aunt by marriage, Paquita and I acted for some time like two demented persons. So overjoyed were we at meeting after our long separation. I had received no letters from her, and only two or three of the score I had written had reached their destination, so that we had ten thousand questions to ask and answers to make. She could never gaze enough at me or finish admiring my bronzed skin and a respectable moustache I had grown, while she, poor darling, looked unusually pale, yet withal so beautiful that I marvelled at myself for having, after possessing her, considered any other woman even passably good-looking. I gave her a circumstantial account of my adventures, omitting only a few matters I was in honour bound not to disclose. Thus, when I told her the story of my sojourn, at the Estancia Peralta, I said nothing to betray Demetria's confidence, nor did I think it necessary to mention the episode of that wicked little sprite, Cleta, with the result that she was pleased at the chivalrous conduct I had displayed throughout the whole of that affair, and was ready to take Demetria to her heart. I had not been back twenty-four hours in Montevideo, before a letter from the Lomas de Rocha storekeeper came to justify my caution in having left Demetria at some distance from the town. The letter informed me that Don Hilario had quickly guessed that I had carried off his unhappy master's daughter, and that no doubt was left in his mind when he discovered that, on the day I left the Estancia, a person answering to my description in every particular had purchased a horse and side-saddle and had ridden off towards the estancia in the evening my correspondent warned me that don hilario would be in montevideo even before his letter also that he had discovered something about my connection with the late rebellion and would be sure to place the matter in the hands of the government, so as to have me arrested, after which he would have little difficulty in compelling Demetria to return to the Estancia. For a moment, this intelligence dismayed me. Luckily, Paquita was out of the house when it came, and fearing that she might return and surprise me while I was in that troubled state, I rushed out. Then, skulking through back streets and narrow lanes, peering cautiously about in fear of encountering the minions of the law, I made my escape out of the town. My only desire just then was to get away into some place of safety where I would be able to think over the position quietly, and if possible devise some plan to defeat Don Hilario who had been a little too quick for me. Of many schemes that suggested themselves to my mind, while I sat in the shade of a cactus hedge about a mile from town, I finally determined, in accordance with my old and well-tried rule, to adopt the boldest one, which was to go straight back to Montevideo and claim the protection of my country. The only trouble, was that on my way thither 
I might be caught, and then Paquita would be in terrible distress about me, and perhaps Demetria's escape would be prevented. While I was occupied with these thoughts, I saw a closed carriage pass by, driven towards the town by a tipsy-looking coachman. Coming out of my hiding-place, I managed to stop him and offered him two dollars to drive me to the British consulate. The carriage was a private one, but the two dollars tempted the man, so after securing the fare in advance, he allowed me to get in, and then I closed the windows, leant back on the cushion, and was driven rapidly and comfortably to the house of refuge. I introduced myself to the consul, and told him a story concocted for the occasion, a judicious mixture of truth and lies, to the effect that I had been unlawfully and forcibly seized and compelled to serve in the Blanco army, and that having escaped from the rebels and made my way to Montevideo, I was amazed to hear that the government proposed arresting me. He asked me a few questions, looked at the passport which he had sent me a few days before, then, laughing good-humouredly, put on his hat and invited me to accompany him to the war office close by. The secretary, Colonel Arosena, he informed me, was a personal friend of his, and if we could see him it would be all right. Walking by his side, I felt quite safe and bold again, for I was, in a sense, walking with my hand resting on the superb mane of the British lion, whose roar was not to be provoked with impunity. At the war office, I was introduced by the consul to his friend, Colonel Arosina, a genial old gentleman with a bald head and a cigarette between his lips. He listened with some interest and a smile, slightly incredulous, I thought, to the sad story of the ill-treatment I had been subjected to at the hands of Santa Coloma's rebellious rascals. When I had finished, he pushed over a sheet of paper on which he had scrawled a few words to me, with the remark, Here, my young friend, take this, and you will be safe in Montevideo. We have heard about your doings in Florida, also in Rocha, but we do not propose going to war with England on your account. At this speech we all laughed. Then, when I had pocketed the paper, which bore the sacred seal of the war office on the margin, and requested all persons to refrain from molesting the bearer in his lawful outgoings and incomings, we thanked the pleasant old colonel and retired. I spent half an hour strolling about with the consul, then we separated. I had noticed two men in military uniform at some distance from us, when we were together, and now, returning homewards, I found that they were following me. By and by they overtook me, and politely intimated their intention of making me their prisoner. I smiled, and drawing forth my protection from the war office, handed it to them. They looked surprised, and gave it back, with an apology for having molested me then left me to pursue my way in peace. I had, of course, been very lucky throughout all this adventure. Still, I did not wish to attribute my easy escape entirely to luck, for I had, I thought, contributed a good deal towards it by my promptness in acting and in inventing a plausible story on the spur of the moment. Feeling very much elated, I strolled along the sunny streets, gaily swinging my cane, when turning a corner near Doña Isidora's house, I suddenly came face to face with Don Hilario. This unexpected encounter threw us both off our guard, he recoiling two or three paces backward 
and turning as pale as the nature of his complexion would allow i recovered first from the shock so far i had been able to baffle him and knew moreover many things of which he was ignorant still he was there in the town with me and had to be reckoned with and i quickly resolved to meet him as a friend affecting entire ignorance of his object in coming to montevideo don hilario you here happy the eyes that behold you i exclaimed seizing and shaking his hand pretending to be overjoyed at the meeting in a moment he recovered his usual self-possessed manner and when i asked after doña demetria he answered after a moment's hesitation that she was in very good health come don hilario i said we are close to my aunt isidora's house where i am staying and it will give me great pleasure to present you to my wife who will be glad to thank you for your kindness to me at the estancia your wife don ricardo do you tell me that you are married he exclaimed in amazement thinking probably that i was already the husband of demetria what did i not tell you before i said ah i remember speaking to doña demetria about it strange that she has not mentioned it to you yes i was married before coming to this country my wife is an argentine come with me and you shall see a beautiful woman if that is an inducement he was without doubt astonished and mystified but he had recovered his mask and was now polite collected watchful when we entered the house i presented him to doña isidora who happened to be in the way and left her to entertain him i was very glad to do so knowing that he would seize the opportunity to try and discover something from the garrulous old lady and that he would discover nothing since she had not been let into our secrets i found paquita lying down in her room having a siesta and while she arrayed herself at my express desire in her best dress a black velvet which set off her matchless beauty better than anything else i told her how i wished her to treat don hilario she knew all about him of course and hated him with all her heart looking on him as a kind of evil genius from whose castle i had carried off the unhappy demetria but i made her understand that our wisest plan was to treat him graciously she readily consented for argentine women can be more charmingly gracious than any other women on the globe and what people do well they like to be called on to do the subtle caution of our snaky guest did not serve to hide from my watchful eyes that he was very much surprised when he beheld her she placed herself near him and spoke in her sweetest artless manner of the pleasure my return had given her and of the gratitude she had felt towards him in all the people at the estancia peralta for the hospitable treatment i had received there he was as i had foreseen completely carried away by her exquisite beauty and the charm of her manner towards him he was flattered and exerted himself to be agreeable but at the same time he was very much puzzled the baffled expression was more apparent on his face every moment while his restless glances darted here and there about the room yet ever returned like the doomed moth to the candle to those lustrous violet eyes overflowing with hypocritical kindness paquita's acting delighted me and i only hoped that he would long suffer from the effect of the subtle poison she was introducing into his system when he rose to go i was sure that demetria's disappearance was a greater mystery to him than ever and as a parting shot 
I warmly invited him to come and see us frequently while he remained in the capital, even offering him a bed in the house, while Paquita, not to be behindhand, for she had thoroughly entered into the fun of the thing, entrusted him with a prettily worded affectionate message to Demetria, a person whom she already loved and hoped some day to meet. Two days after this adventure, I heard that Don Hilario had left Montevideo, that he had discovered nothing, I was positive. It was possible, however, that he had left some person to watch the house, and as Paquita was now anxious to get back to her own country, I determined to delay our departure no longer. Going down to the harbor, I found the captain of a small schooner trading between Montevideo and Buenos Aires, and learning that he intended leaving for the last port in three days' time, I bargained with him to take us, and got him also to consent to receive Demetria on board at once. I then sent a message to Mr. Barker, asking him to bring his guest up to town and put her on board the schooner without coming near me. Two days later, early in the morning, I heard that she was safe on board, and having thus baffled the scoundrel Hilario, on whose ophidian skull I should have been very pleased to set my heel, and having still an idle day before me, I went once more to visit the mountain, to take from its summit my last view of the purple land where I had spent so many eventful days. When I approached the crest of the great solitary hill, I did not gaze admiringly on the magnificent view that opened before me, nor did the wind, blowing fresh from the beloved Atlantic, seem to exhilarate me. My eyes were cast down, and I dragged my feet like one that was weary. Yet I was not weary, but now I began to remember that on a former occasion I had on this mountain spoken many vain and foolish things concerning a people about whose character and history I was then ignorant. I also remembered with exceeding bitterness that my visit to this land had been the cause of great and perhaps lasting sorrow to one noble heart. How often, said I to myself, have I repented of those cruel, scornful words I addressed to Dolores at our last interview, and now once more I come to pluck the berries, harsh and crude, of repentance and of expiation, to humble my insular pride in the dust, and unsay all the unjust things I formerly spoke in my haste. It is not an exclusively British characteristic to regard the people of other nationalities with a certain amount of contempt, but with us, perhaps, the feeling is stronger than with others, or else expressed with less reserve. Let me now at last rid myself of this error, which is harmless and perhaps even commendable in those who stay at home, and also very natural, since it is a part of our unreasonable nature to distrust and dislike the things that are far removed and unfamiliar. Let me at last divest myself of these old English spectacles, framed in oak and with lenses of horn, to bury them forever in this mountain, which for half a century and upwards has looked down on the struggles of a young and feeble people against foreign aggression and domestic foes, and where a few months ago I sang the praises of British civilization, lamenting that it had been planted here and abundantly watered with blood, only to be plucked up again and cast into the sea. After my rambles in the interior, 
where I carried about in me only a fading remnant of that old, time-honored superstition to prevent the most perfect sympathy between me and the natives I mixed with. I cannot say that I am of that opinion now. I cannot believe that if this country had been conquered and recolonized by England, and all that is crooked in it made straight according to our notions, my intercourse with the people would have had the wild, delightful flavor I have found in it. And if that distinctive flavor cannot be had along with the material prosperity resulting from Anglo-Saxon energy, I must breathe the wish that this land may never know such prosperity. I do not wish to be murdered. No man does. Yet rather than see the ostrich and deer chased beyond the horizon, the flamingo and black-necked swan slain on the blue lakes, and the herdsman sent to twang his romantic guitar in Hades as a preliminary to security of person, I would prefer to go about prepared at any moment to defend my life against the sudden assaults of the assassin. We do not live by bread alone, and British occupation does not give to the heart all the things for which it craves. Blessings may even become curses, when the gigantic power that bestows them on us scares from our midst the shy spirits of beauty and of poesy. Nor is it solely because it appeals to the poetic feelings in us that this country endears itself to my heart. It is the perfect republic, the sense of emancipation experienced in it by the wanderer from the old world is indescribably sweet and novel. Even in our ultra-civilized condition at home, we do periodically escape back to nature, and, breathing the fresh mountain air, and gazing over vast expanses of ocean and land, we find that she is still very much to us. It is something more than these bodily sensations we experience when first mingling with our fellow creatures, where all men are absolutely free and equal as here. I fancy I hear some wise person exclaiming, No, 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 in name only is your purple land a republic. Its constitution is a piece of waste paper. Its government an oligarchy tempered by assassination and revolution. True, but the knot of ambitious rulers, all striving to pluck each other down, have no power to make the people miserable. The unwritten constitution, mightier than the written one, is in the heart of every man to make him still a republican and free with a freedom it would be hard to match anywhere else on the globe. The Bedouin himself is not so free, since he accords an almost superstitious reverence and implicit obedience to his sheikh. Here, the lord of many leagues of land and of herds unnumbered sits down to talk with the hired shepherd and a poor, bare-footed fellow in his smoky rancho, and no class or caste difference divides them. No consciousness of their widely different positions chills the warm current of sympathy between two human hearts. How refreshing it is to meet with this perfect freedom of intercourse, tempered only by that innate courtesy and native grace of manner peculiar to Spanish Americans. What a change to a person coming from lands with higher and lower classes, each with its innumerable hateful subdivisions, to one who aspires not to mingle with the class above him, yet who shudders 
at the slouching carriage and abject demeanour of the class beneath him. If this absolute equality is inconsistent with perfect political order, I, for one, should grieve to see such order established. Moreover, it is by no means true that the communities which oftenest startle us with crimes of disorder and violence are morally worse than others. A community in which there are not many crimes cannot be morally healthy. There were practically no crimes in Peru under the Inca dynasty. It was a marvelous thing for a person to commit an offense in that empire, and the reason for this most unnatural state of things was this. The Inca system of government was founded on that most iniquitous and disastrous doctrine that the individual bears the same relation to the state as a child to its parents, that its life from the cradle to the grave must be regulated for it by a power it is taught to regard as omniscient, a power practically omnipresent and almighty. In such a state there could be no individual will, no healthy play of passions, and consequently no crime. What wonder that a system so unspeakably repugnant to a being who feels that his will is a divinity working within him fell to pieces at the first touch of foreign invasion, or that it left no vestige of its pernicious existence on the continent it had ruled. For the whole state was, so to speak, putrid even before dissolution and when it fell, it mingled with the dust, and was forgotten. Poland, before its conquest by Russia, a country ill-governed and disorderly as the Banda Oriental, did not mingle with dust like that when it fell. The implacable despotism of the Tsar was unable to crush its fierce spirit. Its will still survived to gild dreary oppression with hollowed dreams, to make it clutch with a fearful joy the dagger concealed in its bosom. But I had no need to go away from this green continent to illustrate the truth of what I have said. People who talk and write about the disorderly South American republics are fond of pointing to Brazil, that great, peaceful, progressive empire, a setting an example to be followed, an orderly country, yes, and the people in it steeped to their lips in every abominable vice. Compared with these emasculated children of the equator, the Orientals are nature's noblemen. I can very well imagine some over-righteous person saying, Alas, poor deluded soul! How little importance can we attach to your specious apologies of a people's lawlessness, when your own personal narrative shows that the moral atmosphere you have been breathing has quite corrupted you? Go back over your own record, and you will find that you have, according to our notions, offended in various ways and on diverse occasions and that you are even without the grace to repent of all the evil things you have thought, said, and done. I have not read many books of philosophy, because when I tried to be a philosopher, happiness was always breaking in, as someone says. Also, because I have loved to study men rather than books, but in the little I have read there occurs a passage I remember well, and this I shall quote as my answer to anyone who may call me an immoral person, because my passions have not always remained in a quiescent state, like hounds. To quote the simile of a South American poet, slumbering at the feet of the huntsman, resting against a rock at noon. 
we should regard the perturbations of the mind says spinoza not in the light of vices of human nature but as properties just as pertinent to it as are heat storms thunder and the like to the nature of the atmosphere which phenomena though inconvenient are yet necessary and have fixed causes by means of which we endeavour to understand their nature and the mind has just as much pleasure in seeing them aright as in knowing such things as flatter the senses let me have the phenomena which are inconvenient as well as the things which flatter the senses and the chances are that my life will be a healthier and happier one than that of the person who spends his time on a cloud blushing at nature's naughtiness it is often said that an ideal state a utopia where there is no folly crime or sorrow has a singular fascination for the mind now when i meet with a falsehood i care not who the great persons who proclaim it may be i do not try to like it or believe it or mimic the fashionable prattle of the world about it i hate all dreams of perpetual peace all wonderful cities of the sun where people consume their joyful monotonous years in mystic contemplations or find their delight like buddhist monks in gazing on the ashes of dead generations of devotees the state is one unnatural unspeakably repugnant the dreamless sleep of the grave is more tolerable to the active healthy mind than such an existence if signor gaudentio di luca still keeping himself alive by means of his marvellous knowledge of the secrets of nature were to appear before me now on this mountain to inform me that the sacred community he resided with in central africa was no mere dream and should offer to conduct me to it i should decline to go with him i should prefer to remain in the banda oriental even though by so doing i should grow at last to be as bad as any person in it and ready to wade through slaughter to the presidential chair for even in my own country of england which is not so perfect as old peru or the poffers country in central africa i have been long divided from nature and now in this oriental country whose political misdeeds are a scandal alike to pure england and impure brazil i have been reunited to her for this reason i love her with all her faults here like santa coloma i will kneel down and kiss this stone as an infant might kiss the breast that feeds it here fearless of dirt like john carrick fergus i will thrust my hands into the loose brown soil to clasp the hands as it were of dear mother nature after our long separation farewell beautiful land of sunshine and storm of virtue and of crime may the invaders of the future fare on your soil like those of the past and leave you in the end to your own devices may the chivalrous instinct of santa coloma the passion of dolores the loving kindness of candelaria still live in your children to brighten their lives with romance and beauty may the blight of our superior civilization never fall on your wild flowers or the yoke of our progress be laid on your herdsmen careless graceful music-loving as the birds to make him like the sullen 
abject peasant of the old world. End of chapter 28「Chapter Twenty Nine. The meeting of my fellow travellers took place next day on board the ship, where we three were the only cabin passengers. On going down into the little saloon, I found Demetria waiting for us, considerably improved in appearance by her new dress, but looking pale and anxious, for she probably found this meeting a trying one. The two women looked earnestly at each other, but Demetria, to hide her nervousness, I suppose, had framed her face in the old, impassive, almost cold expression it had worn when I first knew her, and Paquita was repelled by it. So after a somewhat lukewarm greeting, they sat down and made commonplace remarks. Two women, more unlike each other in appearance, character, education, and disposition, it would have been difficult to find. Still, I had hoped they might be friends, and felt keenly disappointed at the result of their first meeting. After an uncomfortable interval, we all rose. I was about to proceed to the deck, they to their respective cabins, when Paquita, without any warning of what was coming, suddenly burst into tears and threw her arms about Demetria's neck. "'Oh, dear Demetria, what a sad life yours has been!' she exclaimed. That was like her, so impulsive, and with such a true instinct, to make her do the right thing always. The other gladly responded to the embrace, and I hastily retreated, leaving them kissing and mingling their tears. When I got out on deck, I found that we were already on our way, sails up, and a fresh wind sending us swiftly through the dull green water. There were five steerage passengers, disreputable-looking fellows in ponchos and slouch hats, lounging about the deck smoking. But when we got outside the harbor, and the ship began to toss a little, they very soon dropped their cigars, and began ignominiously creeping away out of sight of the grinning sailors. Only one remained, a grisly-bearded, rough-looking old gaucho, who firmly kept his seat at the stern, as if determined to see the last of the mount, as the pretty city near the foot of Magellan's Hill, is called by the English people in this region. To satisfy myself that none of these fellows were sent in pursuit of Demetria, I asked our Italian captain who they were and how long they had been on board, and was much relieved to hear that they were fugitives, rebels probably, and had all been concealed for the past three or four days in the ship, waiting to get away from Montevideo. Towards evening, it came on very rough, the wind veering to the south and blowing half a gale, a very favorable wind, as it happened, to take us across this unlovely silver sea, as the poets of the Plata insist on calling it, with its villainous, brick-red chopping waves, so disagreeable to bad sailors. Paquita and Demetria suffered agonies, so that I was obliged to keep with them a good deal. I very imprudently 
told them not to be alarmed, that it was nothing, only sea sickness, and I verily believe they both hated me with all their hearts for a little while in consequence. Fortunately, I had anticipated these harrowing scenes, and had provided a bottle of champagne for the occasion and after I had consumed two or three glassfuls to encourage them, showing how easy this kind of medicine is to take, I prevailed on them to drink the remainder. At length, about ten o'clock in the evening, they began to suspect that their malady was not going to prove fatal, and seeing them so much better, I went up to get some fresh air. There at the stern, still sat the stoical old gaucho, looking extremely miserable. "'Good evening, old comrade,' said I. "'Will you smoke a cigar?' "'Young master, you seem to have a good heart,' he returned, shaking his head at the preferred cigar. "'Do, for God's sake, get me a little rum. I am dying for something to warm my inside.' and stop my head from going round like a top, but nothing can I get from these jabbering foreign brutes on board. Yes, why not, my old friend, said I, and going to the master of the boat, I succeeded in getting a pint of rum in a bottle. The old fellow clutched it with eager delight, and took a long draught. Ah, he said, patting first the bottle, then his stomach. This puts new life into a man. Will this voyage never end, master? When I am on horseback, I can forget that I am old, but these cursed waves remind me that I have lived many years. I lit my cigar and sat down to have a talk with him. Ah, with you foreigners it is just the same land or water he continued you can even smoke what a calm head and quiet stomach you must have but what puzzles me is this senor how you a foreigner came to be travelling with native women now there is that beautiful young senora with the violet eyes who can she be she is my wife old man said I, laughing, a little amused at his curiosity. Ah, you are married then, so young. She is beautiful, graceful, well educated, the daughter of wealthy parents, no doubt, but frail, frail, senor, and some day not a very distant day. But why should I predict sorrow to a gay heart? Only her face, senor, is strange to me. It does not recall the features of any oriental family I know. That is easily explained, I said, surprised at his shrewdness. She is an Argentine, not an oriental. Ah, uh, that explains it, he said, taking another long pull at the bottle. As for the other senora with you, I need not ask you who she is. Why, who is she, I returned. A Peralta, if there ever was one, he returned confidently. His reply disturbed me not a little, for, after all my precautions, this old man had perhaps been sent to follow Demetria. Yes, he continued with an evident pride in his knowledge of families and faces, which tended to allay my suspicions. A Peralta, and not a Madariaga, nor a Sanchez, nor a Zelaya, nor an Ibarra. Do I not know a Peralta when I see one? And here he laughed scornfully at the absurdity of such an idea. Tell me, I said, how do you know a Peralta? The question, he exclaimed, you are a Frenchman or a German from over the sea, and do not understand these things. 
have i borne arms forty years in my country's service not to know a peralta on earth they are with me if i go to heaven i meet them there and in hell i see them for when have i charged into the hottest of the fight and have not found a peralta there before me but i am speaking of the past senor for now i am also like one that has been left on the field forgotten left for the vultures and foxes you will no longer find them walking on the earth only where men have rushed together sword in hand you will find their bones ah friend and here overcome with sad memories the ancient warrior took another drink from his bottle they cannot all be dead said i if as you imagine the senora travelling with me is a peralta as i imagine he repeated scornfully do i not know what i am talking about young sir they are dead i tell you dead as the past dead as oriental independence and honour did i not ride into the fight at Yil de los Medanos with the last of the Peraltas, Calixto, when he received his baptism of blood. Fifteen years old, senor, only fifteen, when he galloped into the fight, for he had the light heart, the brave spirit, and the hand swift to strike of a Peralta, and after the fight our colonel, santa coloma who was killed the other day at san paulo embraced the boy before all the troops he is dead senor and with calixto died the house of peralta you knew santa coloma then i said but you are mistaken he was not killed at san paulo he made his escape so they say the ignorant ones he returned but he is dead for he loved his country and all who are of that mind are slain how should he escape i tell you he is not dead i repeated vexed at his stubborn persistence i also knew him old man and was with him at san paulo he looked at me for a long time and then took another swig from his bottle senor this is not a thing i love joking about said he let us talk of other things what i want to know is what is calixto's sister doing here why has she left her country receiving no reply to this question he went on has she not got property yes a large estancia impoverished ruined if you like but still a very large tract of land when your enemies do not fear you then they cease to persecute a broken old man bereft of reason surely they would not trouble him no no she is leaving her country for other reasons yes there is some private plot against her some design perhaps to carry her off or even to destroy her and get possession of her property naturally in such a case she would fly for protection to buenos aires where there is one with some of her blood in his veins able to protect her person and her property i was astonished to hear him but his last words were a mystery to me there is no one in buenos aires to protect her i said i only will be there as i am here to shield her and if as you think she has an enemy he must reckon with me one who like that calixto you speak of has a hand quick to strike there spoke the heart of a blanco he exclaimed clutching my arm and then 
the boat giving a lurch at that moment, almost dragging me down in his efforts to steady himself. After another sip of rum, he went on. But who are you, young sir, if that is not an impertinent question? Do you possess money, influence, powerful friends, that you take upon yourself the care of this woman? Is it in your power to baffle and crush her enemy or enemies, to protect not only her person, but her property, which in her absence will become the prey of robbers? And who are you, old man? I returned unable to give a satisfactory answer to one of his searching questions. And why do you ask me these things? And who is this powerful person you speak of in Buenos Aires, with some of her blood in his veins, but of whose existence she is ignorant? He shook his head silently, then deliberately proceeded to take out and light a cigarette. He smoked with a placid enjoyment, which made me think that his refusal of my cigar and his bitter complaints about the effects of the ship's tossing on him had merely been to get the bottle of rum out of me. He was evidently a veteran in more senses than one, and now, finding that I would tell him no more secrets, he refused to answer any questions, fearing that I had imprudently told him too much already, I finally left him and retired to my bunk. Next morning we arrived at Buenos Aires and cast anchor about two miles from shore, for that was as near the land as we could get. Presently we were boarded by a custom-house officer, and for some time longer I was engaged in getting out our luggage and in bargaining with the captain to put us on shore. When I had completed these arrangements, I was very much surprised to see the cunning old soldier I had talked with the evening before, sitting in the custom-house boat, which was just putting off from the side. Demetria had been looking on when the old fellow had left the ship, and she now came to me, looking very excited. Richard, she said, did you notice that man who was a passenger with us, and who has just gone off in the boat? It is Santa Coloma. Oh, absurd, I exclaimed. I talked with that old man last night for an hour, an old, grey-bearded gaucho, and no more like Santa Coloma than that sailor. I know I am right, she returned. The general has visited my father at the estancia, and I know him well. He is disguised now, and has made himself look like a peasant, but when he went over the side into the boat, he looked full into my face. I knew him and started. Then he smiled, for he saw that I had recognized him. The very fact that this common-looking old man had gone on shore in the custom-house boat, proved that he was a person of consequence in disguise, and I could not doubt that Demetria was right. I felt excessively annoyed at myself for having failed to penetrate his disguise, for something of the old Marcos Marco style of speaking might very well have revealed his identity if I had only had my wits about me. I was also very much concerned on Demetria's account, for it seemed that I had missed finding out something for her which would have been to her advantage to know. I was ashamed to tell her of that conversation about a relation in Buenos Aires, but secretly determined to try and find Santa Coloma to get him to tell me what he knew. After landing, we put our small luggage into a fly, and were driven to an hotel in Calle Lima, an out-of-the-way place kept by a German. But I knew the house to be a quiet, respectable one, and very moderate in its charges. About five o'clock in the afternoon, 
we were together in the sitting-room on the first floor, looking down on the street from the window, when a well-appointed carriage, with a gentleman and two young ladies in it, drew up before the door. "'Oh, Richard!' exclaimed Paquita in the greatest excitement. "'It is Don Pantaleon Villaverde with his daughters, and they are getting out.' "'Who is Villaverde?' I asked. "'What, do you not know? He is a judge of first instance, and his daughters are my dearest friends. Is it not strange to meet them like this? Oh, I must see them to ask for papa and mamita.' And here she began to cry. The waiter came up with a card from the Signor Villaverde, requesting an interview with the Signorita Peralta. Demetria, who had been trying to soothe Paqueda's intense excitement and infuse a little courage into her, was too much amazed to speak, and in another moment our visitors were in the room. Paquita started up, tearful and trembling, then her two young friends, after staring at her for a few moments, delivered a screech of astonishment and rushed into her arms, and all three were locked together for some time in a triangular embrace. When the excitement of this tempestuous meeting had spent itself, Signor Villaverde, who stood looking on with grave, impressive face, spoke to Demetria, telling her that his old friend, General Santa Coloma, had just informed him of her arrival in Buenos Aires and of the hotel where she was staying. Probably she did not even know who he was, he said. He was her relation. His mother was a Peralta, a first cousin of her unhappy father, Colonel Peralta. He had come to see her with his daughters, to invite her to make his house her home during her stay in Buenos Aires. He also wished to help her with her affairs, which his friend, the general, had informed him were in some confusion. He had, he concluded, many influential friends in the sister city who would be ready to assist him in arranging matters for her. Demetria, recovering from the nervousness she had experienced on finding that Paquita's great friends were her visitors, thanked him warmly and accepted his offer of a home and assistance. Then, with a quiet dignity and self-possession one would hardly expect from a girl coming amongst fashionable people for the first time in her life, she greeted her new-found relations, and thanked them for their visit. As they insisted on taking Demetria away with them at once, she left us to make her preparations, while Paquita remained conversing with her friends, having many questions to ask them. She was consumed with anxiety to know how her family, and especially her father, who made the domestic laws, now, after so many months, regarded her elopement and marriage with me. Her friends, however, either knew nothing or would not tell her what they knew. Poor Demetria, she had, with no time given her for reflection, taken the wise course of at once accepting the offer of her influential and extremely dignified kinsman but it was hard for her to leave her friends at such short notice, and when she came back, prepared for her departure, the separation tried her severely. With tears in her eyes, she bade Paquita farewell, but when she took my hand in hers, for some time her trembling lips refused to speak. Overcoming her emotions by a great effort, she at length said, addressing her visitors. For my escape from a sad and perilous position, and for the pleasure of finding myself here amongst relations, I am indebted to this young friend who has been a brother to me. 
Signor Villaverde listened and bowed towards me, but with no softening in his stern, calm face, while his cold grey eyes seemed to look straight through me at something beyond. His manner towards me made me feel a kind of despair, for how strong must have been his disapproval of my conduct in running off with his friend's daughter, how great his indignation against me when it prevented him from bestowing one smile or one kind word on me to thank me for all I had done for his kinswoman. Yet this was only the reflected indignation of my father-in-law. We went down to the carriage to see them off, and then, finding myself for a moment by the side of one of the young ladies, I tried to find out something for myself. Pray tell me, senorita, I said, what you know about my father-in-law. If it is very bad, I promise you, my wife shall not hear a word of it, but it is best that I should know the truth before meeting him. A cloud came over her bright, expressive face, while she glanced anxiously at Paquita. Then, bending towards me, she whispered, "'Ah, my friend, he is implacable. I am so sorry for Paquita's sake.' And then, with a smile of irrepressible coquetry, she added, "'And for yours.' The carriage drove away, and Demetria's eyes looking back at me, were filled with tears. But in Signor Villaverde's eyes, also glancing back, there was an expression that boded ill for my future. His feeling was natural, perhaps, for he was the father of two very pretty girls. Implacable, and I was now divided from him by no silver or brick-colored sea. By returning I had made myself amenable to the laws I had broken by marrying a girl under age without her father's consent. The person in England who runs away with a ward in chancery is not a greater offender against the law than I was. It was now in his power to have me punished, to cast me into prison for an indefinite time and if not to crush my spirit, he would at least be able to break the heart of his unhappy daughter. Those wild, troubled days in the purple land now seemed to my mind peaceful, happy days, and the bitter days with no pleasure in them were only now about to begin. Implacable. Suddenly, looking up, I found Paquita's violet eyes full of sad questioning, fixed on my face. "'Tell me truly, Richard, what have you heard?' she asked. I forced a smile, and taking her hand, assured her that I had heard nothing to cause her any uneasiness. "'Come,' I said, "'let us go in and prepare to leave town tomorrow. We will go back to the point we started from. Your father's estancia for the sooner this meeting you are thinking about so anxiously is over, the better will it be for all of us. End of chapter 29 End of The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson Appendix of The Purple Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Appendix. History of the Banda Oriental. The country called in this work the Purple Land was discovered by Magellan in the year 1500 and he called the hill or mountain which gives its name to the capital monte vidi he described it as a hat-shaped mountain and it is probable that four centuries ago the tall conical hat which is worn to this day by women in south wales 
was a common form in Spain and Portugal. In due time settlements were made, but the colonists of those days loved gold and adventure above everything, and finding neither in the Banda, they little esteemed it. For two centuries it was neglected by its white possessors, while the cattle they had imported continued to multiply, and returning to a feral life overran the country in amazing numbers. The heroic period in South American history then passed away. El Dorado, the Spaniard's New Jerusalem, has changed into a bank of malarious mist and a cloud of mosquitoes, Amazons, giants, pygmies. The Anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders, when closely looked for, turned out to be red Indians, or a type which varied but little throughout the entire vast continent. Wanderers from the old world grew weary of seeking the tropics only to sink into flowery graves. They turned away sick at heart from the great desolation where the splendid empire of the children of the sun had so lately flourished. The accumulated treasures had been squandered. The cruel crusades of the polis against the Jesuit missions had ceased for the inhuman slave hunters had utterly destroyed the smiling gardens in the wilderness. The remnant of the escaped converts had gone back to a wild life in the woods, and the fathers who had done their master's work so well drifted away to mingle in other scenes or die of broken hearts. Then, in the sober eighteenth century, when the dissolution was complete, Spain woke up to the fact that in the temperate part of the continent shared with her by Portugal, she possessed a new bright little Spain worth cultivating. About the same time, Portugal discovered that the acquisition of this pretty country with its lovely Lusitanian climate would nicely round off her vast possessions on the south side. Forthwith, these two great colonizing powers fell to fighting over the Banda, where there were no temples of beaten gold, or mythical races of men, or fountains of everlasting youth. The quarrel might have continued to the end of time, so languidly was it conducted by both parties, had not great events come to swallow up the little ones. At the beginning of the nineteenth century, the English invasion burst like a sudden terrible thunderstorm on the country. Montevideo on the east and Buenos Aires on the west side of the sea-like river were captured and lost again. The storm was soon over, but it had the effect of precipitating the revolution of 1810, which presently ended in the loss to Spain of all her American possessions. These changes brought only fresh wars and calamities to the long-suffering Banda. The ancient feud between Spain and Portugal descended to the new Brazilian Empire and the new Argentine Confederation, and these claimants contended for the country until 1828, when they finally agreed to let it govern itself in its own fashion. After thus acquiring its independence, the little Belgium of the New World cast off its pretty but hated appellation of cisplatina and resumed its old joyous name of banda oriental with light hearts the people then proceeded to divide themselves into two political parties whites and reds endless struggles for mastery ensued in which the argentines and the brazilians forgetting their solemn compact were forever taking sides but of these wars of crows and pies it would be idle to say more since after going on for three-quarters of a century, they are not wholly ended yet. The rambles and adventures described in the book take us back to the late sixties or early seventies of the last century, when the country was still in the condition in which it had remained since the colonial days, when the ten-year siege of Montevideo was not yet a remote event, and many of the people one met had had a part in it. End of Appendix End of The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson